Welcome back. This is our second deep dive into Catamaran data. Uh, we had some requests on our uh, first Catamaran data video uh, in regards to other things that people wanted to see. And what we're going to discuss today is uh, the impact of motoring on transit time. And uh, more specifically, uh, the question I think is, uh, does a performance catamaran mean that you're going to use less engine time than a traditional cruising catamaran? And I think this is a great question, um, because uh, if you're a sailor to begin with, uh, like I am, and I think like the person who, who asked the question, uh, you hate motoring. <laughs> so the sooner you can turn off the engine, the better, uh, and listen to the serene, quiet sounds of the ocean splashing on the hull. Um, so I tend to agree, and I, I thought the question was great. Uh, so what I did was I dug into the data. Uh, so one of the things that the ARC provides with uh, most of their results is uh, hour counts. And one of the reasons for this is because it's used to score the boats that come in under their um, uh, handicap system. So if you look at their uh, final results, you'll see that a boat that uh, may have actually taken longer to cross the ocean may have scored uh, a higher placing in terms of um, the handicap than a boat that took less time uh, but used more engine hours. Uh, so each engine hour is penalized uh, by a factor and that's added into the total time uh, calculated on the on the results. But I wanted to strip that out because I wanted to see in practicality what transit times look like. Um, because in reality we're gonna end up using engine periodically. Um, you, you're gonna get into a doldrum or something, a period of, of no wind and you want to make some headway. Or you just want to charge up batteries or you want to do uh, it could be a lot of reasons why you turn on the, the, the engine. Uh, so that said, um, I, I, in this series of calculations, I put the engine hours um, onto the spreadsheet and calculated them separately. So we've, we've, I've still sorted the boats by their um, percent better than average transit time. That way I can compare, again, I'd use the same four years of data. Uh, if I can compare each of those four years against each other, the normalization technique that I used was to say, okay, um, how did an individual boat compare against the average for that year? Uh, and that allows us to, to sort out, well, one year had more wind than the other um, and allows us to more evenly compare them side by side. It's not perfect, but it's, it's about the best I could come up with. So that number is that percent better than average. So boat A transits across in year 2016 uh, we compare its time versus the average for 2016, and that's a percentage number. And that goes into the final spreadsheet where we compare all four years. You know, same, same thing for a boat that goes in 2017. Its specific time versus the average time for that year uh, is a percentage, and that goes on to the final spreadsheet. So that, that all got tallied in. That's what we did the first time. That's how we figured out which boats were, were the you know, quickest across the, uh, uh, the, the pond, so to speak. Um, a couple of commenters asked me to put the other boats back in that I had taken out. Um, so I did that here. I, I put back in uh, some of the boats that either got uh, uh, sort of disqualified because they didn't actually go to the finish line, like uh, 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 Allegra uh, was actually the the fastest boat across in 2019, uh, even though Hollison got the, the credit for it uh, because Allegra didn't actually go to the final port and check in. Uh, they went to a different island and did whatever they did. Uh, they decided that wasn't important to them. Uh, so they actually were the fastest across the pond for, for 2019. Uh, so I did put that in here just for reference. And uh, I also put back in uh, more specifically the Marsodons um, because uh, several commenters had mentioned, yeah, these boats are actually uh, purchase price wise, you know, fairly considerable, if not cheaper than the Outremer. Uh, so even though they're, uh, to my aesthetic, they're, they're still more of a performance-only catamaran. Uh, you, you look at the interior of those versus the interior even of, of, of Outremer. Uh, the Outremers are more livable looking to me anyway. But for the sake of discussion, I put them back in. Um, and we can see how that they sorted out. Uh, didn't shift the data overall much, if any. Uh, but the numbers are there for everybody to look at. So next question, um, or, or the, the question in... in focus is uh, what impact does the engine uh, time have on these crossings? Uh, so I've put on the spreadsheet and sorted uh, again by their percent 
uh, better than average, and then I put the engine hours right next to them. And we've laid out a graph, and we can see that there um, is really not a clear trend line on engine hours. Uh, the overall trend line, I used the, the, the spreadsheet just to, to plop one in. It's a, a linear, and it shows an, an overall a general increase for engine hour use the slower the boats were across the pond. Uh, but it's not, it's not a great trend line because there's a lot of variation. Uh, but what we do see if we look at that data is that the chunk of boats that come in basically... Um, starting at around five to seven percent better than average and faster that means up to the 30 percent better than average all those boats basically didn't use a whole lot of engine time there were a few exceptions uh and those are outliers uh but they're in there uh most notably is uh mutley that's a granger um basically a custom performance cat um it was pretty clear from watching them go across the, the pond that it, it was uh, almost a certain that they were doing a lot of motoring because they have their trajectory was basically a dead beeline from uh, the Cape Verde Islands right over to St. Lucia. Uh, I, was, I was seeing that they didn't tack at all. <laughs> it was a, just a straight beeline from one to the other. And lo and behold, when we got the data back, it showed that they had something like, I think it was 200 something hours of, of engine time. Um, so that you know that shows up pretty clearly on the chart. You can see that big spike. Uh, but again, back to the that cutoff where we start to see a lot of engine use. Um, that's around the like I said, the five to seven percent better than average uh, mark. We start to see an increase in boats that are slower than that, using a lot more engine hours. You know, hundreds of hours of of engine time. Now that said, we can say okay, well, that's probably the the threshold for where boats were trying right um so anything that was <laughs> basically in that zone and slower were folks that were just having a good time going across the channel they didn't care they weren't racing uh they just wanted to have a great time and have a, a companion uh boat nearby in case something went wrong they were looking for the camaraderie etc enjoying a leisurely sail across the pond uh, the ones that were faster than that were probably paying a little more attention to sail trim and trying to get there quickly without using the engine too much with the exception of like we said some of the uh, Mutley's, etc. Uh, now, looking into um, those boats and the times that they made, uh, there's there's no apparent correlation between engine hours and speed. Uh, every, you know, the, using that rough cutoff line of that seven and a half to uh, you know five to seven and a half better than average. Looking at what's in there for boats, there's plenty of lagoons. Uh, Leopards, uh, even a Sun Reef 60, uh, which is a floating palace. Uh, there, there's plenty of quote unquote slow boats in that category. Um, so, is it true that a, a faster performance catamaran means that you have to, you will need to motor less? It doesn't seem that way. Um, I think if you are a sailor and you like to trim your sails and take advantage of the wind as it comes, uh, you're going to do fine in no matter what kind of boat that you're using. Um, not to brag, but, uh, you know, I grew up sailing on uh, a lake with lots of peninsulas that jet into the into the water, and you had to sail around all these weird eddy currents and swirls. Um, I remember someone coming and bragging about how they had a lot of sailing history and, and going out on the lake in a boat alongside of us, and they were helpless. <laughs> they couldn't deal with the shifting winds and changes, and, you know, my brother and I, we hop out there, and you, well... You can see the breeze coming across the water and you change your sail trim to, to match what's coming and you carry on and you, you see a peninsula, you know the wind's going to swirl around that, you deal with it and you, you move on. So, um, you know, this idea that, you know, these these cruising cats don't move with, with a little bit of wind, I think, is a bit of a fallacy. Yeah, sure, they're going to move slow, but all boats move slow when there's a little bit of wind. Um, it's rare that you're going to see a boat that goes much faster, if, if faster at all, than the wind. So if you've only got four or five knots of wind, you're certainly not going to get much more than four or five knots of, of boat speed. Um, the, uh, uh, the mathematics of it, I used a, uh, a correlation calculation, and we'll see that in the chart here to take a look at a couple of these things, just to see if there was a, you know, rather than just using eyeball and uh, a gut feel or subjective measure, I wanted something mathematical. So I chose uh, a statistical method called correlation, and this gives us a measurement of two sets of data. 
to see how related they are. So a correlation of zero means that um, these, these sets of numbers, they, they're completely unrelated. There's no pattern between the two of them. Uh, a correlation of one uh, means that these two sets of data are exactly the same, right? They, they trend in the same direction. If you've got um, one, 10, and, or, 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 you know, one, one, five, 10 versus uh, 10, 50, 100, you put the, those two and correlate the two of them, they correlate at one because they're, they have the exact same pattern. You know, they're, they're just a, a zero a decimal point different. Um, so that's so, sort of how that calculation works. So I compared the three, uh, and if we look at the data, we can see that, you know, there is a, a, a poor correlation between engine hours and crossing time. In fact, it's a negative correlation, which means there's there's absolutely no pattern going on between the two. There's some fast boats that use it, there's some slow boats that use it, um, and vice versa. Uh, just out of curiosity, to back up what I had said in the last video, I wanted to see, well, what is the correlation between uh, crossing time and boat length? And we can clearly see uh, a much more positive uh, correlation here. I think it was 0.6 or something like that um, between the uh, boat length and the crossing time. So again, back to what I had come to a summary on in the last video. Uh, to me, it looks like you're better off spending some more money on length than you are on performance, uh, quote unquote performance. Uh, so, you know, instead of hunting down the, the ultra light daggerboard cat and not putting anything in it but your skivvies um, it, it doesn't seem worth it uh, you can just get a longer uh, cruising catamaran and get nearly the same performance uh, and get there within you know cross the Atlantic Ocean within a day or two uh, of, of the other one with uh, all your bottles of scotch and whiskey uh, on, on tow uh, and enjoying the ride uh, you know toys floats stand up paddle boards, whatever you want, stuff them all in there. Cause, uh, you know, like I said, it's not going to penalize you more than a day or so. Uh, if you're paying attention to, to your sail trims. Um, so that's it. Um, we got probably one more question, um, that we're going to dive into on this data set, uh, unless somebody else comes up with some more uh, questions for us. Uh, but the other question was pretty interesting and we're going to dive into that next time is, um, what about you know, the ARC is, is predominantly a downwind sail, you know, where they're following the trade winds from um, La Gran Canaria to uh, St. Lucia. It's almost all the wind behind the boat. Uh, the other question was, well, what about uh, if the, you're sailing into the wind, um, you know, sailing upwind, we've you know, always heard that the catamarans don't point as well as monohulls. And that's true in a lot of cases. Um, so, Great question. Uh, if you have a performance catamaran, uh, are you going to get places quicker if you're sailing into the current? And I'm having a little bit of trouble getting us some, some good data on this. There's some data out there, but the quantity is poor. So our statistical significance is going to be low. Um, but I think I have some ideas. Um, using the same general source, the uh, World Cruising Club has some uh, data on crossings in different parts of the world. You know, there's the World ARC, there's the, uh, you know, Caribbean, uh, American, European, Portugal. There's a bunch of different crossings that they have data for and we can go dive into. Uh, so we'll take a look at that and we'll try and find some uh, cases and point where the prevailing wind is more uh, to the to the bow than it is uh, to the stern and see what happens to uh, boat data. So that's it. Um, please hit, uh, like and subscribe if you like these and uh, we love to hear your comments and feedback. So if you have more stuff you want us to make videos on, uh, let me know and we'll see what we can do about it. Thanks.